This is the City of Wapaka, third Tuesday of the month, City Council meeting. All right, this is our regular scheduled City Council meeting tonight, but we do have uh, three public hearings that we are going to take care of first. Um, and then we'll go into the regular scheduled city council meeting. Uh, so we're going to start with the uh, public hearing. This is an ordinance amending the city of Opaca year 2030 comprehensive plan. And this is for the preferred land use map, uh, map 8-43. And Aaron, do you want to just explain why we are looking at doing this? Yep, so this is a comp plan amendment for uh, the property that is owned by the Timber Ridge Apartments. Um, it is SCS Timber Ridge Apartments. Uh, it's a parcel off of Highway 54. State statutes require that the desired land use within the comprehensive plan matches our zoning code. Um, the suggested comp plan changes from commercial office use to mixed use residential. Um, and they're coming forward uh, with a plan for apartments in that area. I mean, it was approved by plan commission on November 6th. Uh, really no concerns from a staff level, so. Okay, so at this time then we will take testimony in favor of this ordinance amendment. If you'd like to give testimony in favor, please step up to the podium, give your name and address for the record and limit your discussion to three minutes or less. Anybody that would like to give uh, testimony in favor? Any testimony in opposition? Any testimony in opposition? I declare this hearing closed at uh, 6.02 p.m. Next up, we have a public hearing. Let me get to that page here quick. Okay, and this is a notice of public hearing for preliminary plan unit development plan. And Aaron, again, you want to just real quick. Yep, uh, this says, uh, this accompanies the last one. Uh, we're talking about the same property, same project. Um, and this is a planned unit development, uh, the application for approval for the multiple family use um, apartments that SCS Timber Ridge uh, is planning in that area. So again, from a staffing, uh, this was again uh, taken to plan commission November 6th uh, and approved through that, um, no, no staffing concerns. All right, uh, so again, at this time, we'll take testimony in favor of this uh, PUD uh, uh, plan. Anybody that'd like to give testimony in favor, step up to the podium, give your name and address for the record and limit your discussion to three minutes or less. Any testimony in favor? Any testimony in opposition? Testimony in opposition. Uh, this hearing is closed at uh, 6.04 p.m. All right, uh, the next one uh, is our uh, 2020 annual property tax levy and budget. And I call this meeting to order. We have all council members in attendance except for uh, uh, Alan Keelan. And uh, Kathy, you want to just uh, talk about it a little bit? Sure. Here? Um, we did receive more information. Um, the state released uh, yesterday the school levy tax credit. Uh, the city's amount for 2019's tax levy would be $716,042.49, uh, which is down uh, from the prior years by $12,550.26. Um, so we're getting more pieces of the tax uh, rate, but none of the other rates that I released uh, at the committee of the whole meeting have changed. The rate uh, with the TIF increment uh, for next year will be $26.44 less the school levy credit. So the net uh, tax levy rate for the city will be $24.71 which is a reduction of $2.53 per thousand. So uh, none of the other um, budgets have changed. Uh, what was presented uh, at the Committee of the Whole, those all still stand. 
Okay. Thank you, Kathy. And, and this was posted in the newspaper and... Um, the city website. Okay. And both of these are put on... Okay. Mm -hmm. All right, uh, so at this time, then, we will take testimony in favor of the, the uh, budget uh, for 2020. If you would like to give testimony in favor of this proposed budget, uh, step up to the podium, give your name and address for the record, <coughs> limit your time to three minutes or less. Approval of the budget. Anybody? Any testimony in opposition to the budget proposal? Any testimony in opposition? All right, I declare this hearing closed at uh, 6.06 p.m. Let's uh, move on then to our regular city council meeting. I call the city council meeting to order. It's actually 6.06 p.m. Uh, and we'll begin with the Pledge of Allegiance. Everyone please rise. I pledge Allegiance to the flag the United States of America, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. We better use that. Yeah, probably. Right or wrong. Okay, we'll ask Sandy to read the clerk's open meeting statement for us. This meeting and all meetings of the Common Council are open to the public. Proper notice has been posted and given to the media in accordance with Wisconsin state statutes, so the citizens may be aware of the time, place, and agenda of this meeting. And uh, also take roll for us. Brian Smith. Here. Steve Hackett. Here. Lori Chestnut. Here. Paul Hagen. Here. Alan Keeland. Scott Prochatsky. Here. Dave Peterson. Here. Paul Mayo. Here. Dimitri Martin. Here. Mary Fair. Here. And Eric Olson. Here. Nine present, we have a quorum. Okay, next up is the consent agenda. This is for items that uh, we vote on with one motion. So each one of these items that's in there, we just take one motion for the whole bunch of those, unless uh, we have uh, council members or staff that would like to see them move from the consent agenda to the regular agenda. And if we did move them to the regular agenda, then we would act on those items individually. And Sandy, I think you have some additions to the consent agenda. Yes. Under number five, consent agenda letter A, monthly reports, the finance director's treasurer's report for the month of November <clears throat> was uploaded to the city website. And also under number five, consent agenda letter D, approval of bills was uploaded to the city website. All right, so you have the consent agenda in front of you with those two additions. Make a motion to approve. A motion by Hackett. Second. Second by Chestnut that we approve the consent agenda as printed with those two additions, I'm sorry, with the two additions. Discussion, all in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Against, motion carried, regular agenda, Sandy. Under number 7A, announcements and correspondence number three, an addendum is added, um, listing proclamation designating December 2nd, 2019 as Christmas Stamp Day in Wapaka. And that's it. All right. Okay, so next up we have, uh, under our regular agenda, we have announcements and correspondence. Uh, we're going to start with uh, a presentation by uh, Marcy Reynolds. Did you make a motion to approve the regular agenda? No, we didn't. I'll make a motion we approve. I'll second. I'm just keeping you on task. Thank you. <laughs> motion by Hackett, second by Peterson, that we approve the regular agenda. Any discussion? All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Against, motion carried. You know, as my, uh, for, as the former mayor, Jim Lewinsky, used to say, you get at least one or two senior moments each night. So <laughs> that's my <laughs> one so far. All right, Marcy, go ahead. Okay. Um, I'd like to thank Aaron for inviting me to come and present and the mayor and everybody. Um, 
Thank you for allowing me to give this presentation tonight. I'm going to be talking about an idea or a vision for the old St. Mary's Church, and I'm assuming everyone knows where that is. And hopefully you had a chance to read the executive summary of this vision in your packet. So I'll just go through um, a brief kind of hopefully brief <laughs> presentation. So um, we are trying to envision Wapaka a Wapaka Art Rec Center. So think about the rec center that we have where a lot of kids go after school and on weekends. A lot of activities, um, mostly sports oriented. So we're envisioning a similar setting for the arts to be implemented potentially at the Old St. Mary's Church. Um, this is just the table of contents of our uh, presentation. We'll be going through quite a few things. So I'd like you to all envision an arts rec center at St. Mary Magdalene's former church site. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Um, so the vision is a more creative, connected, inspired, and welcoming Wapaka. Our mission would be to develop the Wapaka Arts Rec Center, a place where Wapaka area youth and adults are welcome to explore and develop their creativity through art, regardless of their ability to pay and their ability of skill, actually. So the three prongs of this plan for St. Mary's would be there would be programming for youth, programming for adults, and also if it was in St. Mary's, performance and event space as well. Um, and we're going to go through um, some details on all three of those aspects. Um, the facility, uh, the programs enabled by the space that accommodates private instruction, group classes, exhibits, and performance and events. So this is not a new idea to Wapaka. Um, I mean, it's new to Wapaka, but it's not a new idea. There are many examples of successful models that utilize the format that I'm going to propose. Um, there's the Appleton Rock School, which has started out in a guy's garage and grew to be um, a really successful program. They actually recently have <coughs> purchased a large building for that program. In Nina, there's the Kurt Stein School of Music, which is a similar program to the Rock School in Appleton. In Manaqua, the Campanese Arts Center or Center for the Arts is set up exactly the way we're proposing to set this up where they have um, an arts school for adults and kids connected to a church which is the performance space. In Stevens Point there's a noteworthy music studio and there's also um, a similar setup. Um, I think it's a branded thing. It's in Marshfield. And um, actually there's also the National Franchise School of Rock. Um, so we know that Basing, um, basing a program on the model that we're going to propose is a viable business option. So starting out with youth programming, we're going to talk about the need and the opportunity, program overview, and benefits to our youth and community. So for the youth, um, there are many benefits to engaging in the arts. Um, we have no, multiple articles that I think I passed out, Mary passed out for you guys. There's a bibliography there. So if you want to read up on any of the evidence for what I'm talking about, I've cited lots of articles. So the arts um, help with personal development. There's, sh It's shown that academic performance is increased in um, kids that engage in the arts. And career readiness and achievement is also related to engaging in the arts. As far as socialization and community development, um, mental health improves when kids are involved in the arts, confidence and self-esteem increases, and kids develop a sense of belonging and identity. And those are the key factors um, that have actually gotten me interested in starting this program. I work um, with kids now as a piano teacher, and I've seen the effects of confidence, self-esteem, and sense of identity just grow in the kids that I've, I've been teaching. And so I, I'm really sold on that idea. Um, and also, uh, youth with interest in the arts, um, in our town, really, they lack convenient access to facilities and instruction outside of school. And so they aren't really able to explore any of these types of skills and um, lifelong learning. So we have a rec center that's really rich with um, sports and those types of extracurricular activities. But if somebody wants to take private piano lessons or guitar lessons, there are not very many 
um, teachers in town. During the Bach Festival, we actually did a survey and we compiled the names of all of the teachers that teach privately in the Wapaka area. And of the seven piano teachers, I'm the youngest one and I'm 60. <laughs> so we know that in addition to not having very many piano teachers, um, that number is going to drastically reduce in the next five years. So um, that's an issue. Um, it's hard to recruit or develop new piano teachers because nowadays people don't really want to teach out of their home. They want to be part of a facility um, and have the support of the facility to run that business. So that's one of the key factors that, in terms of recruiting teachers, this facility would help. Um, so. With that said, um, the other key point in this um, vision is that we all know that 40% and possibly more of the students within our school district are on free and reduced lunch, which actually means that they meet the poverty guidelines. So it's very difficult to engage in anything that costs money. So a key component of our vision is that there would be a very strong scholarship fund to help subsidize based on people's income, family income. So for instance, if somebody um, was at literally 200% of the poverty level, they would get a subsidy of X percent and it would be like a sliding fee scale. Um, so to begin with, we'd have private music lessons. There would be one-on-one -on -one and there would also be group lessons. Um, piano, guitar, bass, drums, ukulele, and voice. And there would also be art classes, um, drawing, painting, sculpture, pottery, and possibly cooking if we were at St. Mary's. And then there would be a maker space, so we would have some permanently set up spaces that would accommodate a particular type of art that would be difficult to do on one's own. So for instance, our idea is to have a pottery studio, studio for sure, and possibly a textile studio. Okay. The benefits to the community, um, well, less idle time with kids after school. We know that um, after school, a lot of parents aren't able to be at home with their kids, so kids go to the rec center or the library now. This would be a little bit more structured and engaged time for the kids that are really interested in the arts. Um, we know the benefits of uh, improved academic performance, valuable work-life work skills, creativity, leadership, teamwork, and focus and discipline are all benefits of engaging in the arts. Um, another key factor is that youth build uh, relationships with adults, and that's important, that mentorship that comes part and parcel to being in that sort of a setting. Um, fosters a sense of belonging and identity. We know that that's a key factor that leads um, youth into potentially harmful lifestyles like drug addiction and violence. So when you have an identity of, you think of yourself as part of this group, you're less likely to engage in those activities. And um, it also creates an economic opportunity for music teachers because this is not going to be a volunteer program. People are going to be paid. So it's actually um, got some job growth potential to it. The adult programming, um, we'll talk a little bit about the same topics, need opportunity, program overview, and benefits to our youth and community. But I have to say they're pretty much the same as for the youth. Um, but as a community, this is a key factor. We have a growing arts reputation. We've just recently, as a city um, government, you guys won that award for um, creating an arts and culture plan. So we are really stepping into the arts economy and arts community realm. And when that happens, people get more and more interested in the arts. So we're sure that there's going to be opportunity for adults at this center and we want to provide that for everybody because of the more arts you have, the more people want to engage in it. Um, boy, I need a new prescription for my glasses. Holy crap. <laughs> Some adults in our community lack um, access to studio space or practice space if they're in a band. Um, there's no publicly available pottery studio in our area. Um, there's not convenient space for any types of programming for adults. There are, I have to say, there have been various art classes that are kind of one and done, like the painting and sipping classes that are done in various venues, but no place that it's conveniently set up that you can just consistently know that there are art classes. And low-income residents have fewer opportunities to pursue their interests in the arts. 
So uh, this is really identical to the kids. Um, our programming to begin with would be private music lessons and art classes and makerspace. And we envision creating a makerspace kind of membership that people can join on a monthly basis and kind of delve into their art form. And I would like to say that um, there are plenty of adults that like to take music lessons. I have a few adults in my studio already. Um, benefits to the community, it enhances our reputation as an arts community. Um, it improves the quality of life. It builds relationships amongst diverse citizens as well as generations. And we know that the arts contribute to health. Um, I saw this in my career as a nurse. We did a lot of artistic things in our department. And when people engage in that, their mood changes, which improves their health. Um, I already said multi-generational environment, sense of belonging, which is very, very important, and becoming kind of something that our citizens have become very um, engaged with trying to increase our sense of belonging for all of our community members. And it creates economic opportunities, i.e. music teachers, art teachers. Additionally to all of that programming, St. Mary's offers us an opportunity to have a performance and event space. Um, so we would be able to do student recitals, youth and adults, concerts, meetings, weddings, and other events in that space. And those types of events would also become something that would help support the space financially. We would have program staff. We would have a part-time director and assistant director, custodian, and paid teachers, and then there's obviously a place for volunteers as well. So facility overview, the wish list can become a reality with St. Mary's. Um, we envision an exhibit space where we can actually have a, a gallery that gets changed out. It can have student art. Um, our phantom art gallery could possibly have space in there. We could have lots of different rotating shows. Private music lesson rooms, there'd be su studios that would be set up for individual teachers. We'd have a group mu music room for ensembles that we would put together, a painting and drawing studio, pottery studio with a kiln, um, a teaching kitchen, which is something that's been really suggested by many community members when they heard about this idea. So there's a lot of creativity we could do with that, plus teaching people how to cook. Um, performance and event space, as I already mentioned, but that would be a very flexible space to accommodate a variety of types of performances. And there's also an opportunity for leased space. There's some office space that could be leased, which would contribute to the bottom line um, of the budget. OK, so um, I think a lot of you know that we did have a community meeting. Um, and I don't want to get you know, too far into the history of how this came about that I um, was requested to present this idea. But I did meet with the current owner, Nino Pedrelli. We walked through the space um, with Jane Drager, talked about this vision. I don't know how many months ago that was, maybe six or eight months ago. And originally, um, Nino was considering presenting this as a plan B. Um, but he made it really clear that he didn't want to end up owning the building, and I think he just kind of wants to <laughs> be done with it. So um, so then Aaron said, well, could I please present this idea anyway? And it's not to be like in competition with Nino, but it's just to bring to light that this is one opportunity, maybe the last opportunity we have to save that historic building. And having an art center in there completely would be doable and a wonderful addition to our community. So knowing that I had this opportunity pr to present, I felt obligated to let the community know. And I was really appreciative that some city council members and Aaron and Brian were there at the meeting. It was a really great, um, I kind of get goosebumps when I think about it because it was like we were all in the room just considering the idea. There was no us and them. Nobody was against anybody. We were all just sort of talking about the possibility and had some really great discussions. Um, so there were about 40 um, community members at this meeting and they had a lot of questions and comments including can the building become part of the historic register, um, sources of major support. Where could we get major support for this project? Can the rectory be rezoned? Um, one woman that was there had worked um, at the church while it was still there, and she said she worked there, and it was considered an office space that Father Venix didn't live there, and so it wasn't really a residence. So we're kind of curious about that. Um, could there be a collaborative relationship with Danes Hall? Um, are there grants available? to help with renovation and our plans are the plans that I'm presenting 
set in stone or could there be additional plans? So those were some of the questions. Um, we did find out a couple things. Um, Scott Christie, who works with the Historic Preservation Board, did some research and if we were to put the building on the National Registry, it, for a nonprofit, we'd be eligible for a 20% tax rebate. Aaron, I don't know if he talked to you about that. Yeah, that's correct. He sent that to me in an email to confirm today, actually. Yeah, okay. Um, so that's one plus. And in terms of grants, I I have a, a young woman friend that is a grant writer, and she said that contrary to my, I, my belief was that you, it's hard to get grants for building projects that you're more lo likely to get grants for programmatic type things, but she actually disagreed with me. She hasn't had time to research it, but that's something that we would look into um, because the cost of renovating St. Mary's, as you can imagine, is quite high. Okay, Chuck. Um, so sources of revenue, um, there would need to be a capital campaign to raise the funds to fully renovate and cover the building operating costs for the first couple years just to get things going. and. I can't remember what slide it's on, but I'm just going to put this out there. I guess we estimated 1.3 million. So I'll let that sink in because that's a lot of money. Um, another source of revenue would be the program fees. Um, and I, if anybody would like to look at the um, business plan that breaks it down literally to the piano lesson level, we can show you that. And as I said before, this is not a new idea. I've run this by other rock and roll schools, and we know that it can be a moneymaker. So it's a self-sustaining business plan. Um, so one-on-one -on -one lessons in group classes um, can cover the cost of running the business. We would also have maker space membership, as we said, and exhibit space. Sometimes exhibit space would become an income generator. Um, concerts and events could also be a source of income. And um, we would, we I talked about the scholarship fund. That would become a separate fundraising effort. Um, I just wanted to mention that we've already started that fund here in Wapaka, and our money is housed under Arts Wisconsin, um, and it's called Cause A. You can find that on Facebook if you want to look at the Cause A group. We have a community of people that are very interested in creating the scholarship fund for people to um, be able to have help subsidized lessons. Um, so this is a financial summary page. Um, Let's see, building renovation, I guess we have a very rough estimate. Now, we don't have an architectural plan, but we did um, actually consult with um, somebody, the same company that worked with the Danes Hall and did all, managed all the re renovation there, and he was very familiar with the building, and it's actually he's here tonight, Tom Hoffman. Um, and so he, he had looked at the building before um, when, I think Mandolin's was thinking of going in there, so he knows the building. And his rough estimate was 600000 to 750000 It needs new HVAC. It needs um, the asbestos abatement. It needs some building repair. But in all in all, the building is a solid building and would be worth saving. Um, there would also be equipment that we would need to purchase, and we would like to have contingency fund to take us through the first few years. Um, so there you can see the chart, which has the revenues and expenses. Um, and surprisingly, like I said, I know it's hard to believe that piano lessons and group lessons can bring in an income, but, but they do. So it's pretty good news. So our project timeline. Um, so what we would do in this year, 2020, is uh, we would start a mini capital campaign um, and launch the, um, the Arts Rec Center programming in an alternate location. Um, because what we'd like to do is get that program up and running while we work on the plans to renovate St. Mary's so that once St. Mary's opened its doors, we would have a viable, successful business starting on day one. So the top line shows the programming in temporary facilities, um, then moving into St. Mary's. So the St. Mary's portion of the plan would, 2020 would be all about planning, capital campaign study, and launching that capital campaign. We would be hiring a 
professional fundraising company to help us with that. Um, we would begin construction in 2021. So obviously, during that time period as well, we would be working with an architect and come up with our plans, complete construction in 2022, and then a grand opening with the established um, arts program moving in. And there you go. That's it. Is that it? Oh, that's literally it. OK. <laughs> um, so I, I guess I don't know what else to say. I, it's a huge thing to think about. Um, like I said, we we had a lot of people at the meeting, and I've had just as many people contacting me personally. There's a lot of support for this idea. Um, I want to make it really clear um, that this arts programming portion of this whole plan will will be happening regardless of St. Mary's. St. Mary's is obviously the ideal spot because it it gives us a performance space and an also additional space to lease out to help with that bottom line. Um, but we're really excited about doing that program just to increase the quality of life in Wapaka and, and offer more services to our families. Um, I, having St. Mary's as part of that, the additional things that brings is it preserves a beautiful building that's been in our history since the early 1900s. It's a viable building and it's something that um, like any old building that's beautiful, people want to preserve. There's been a huge um, call of support for this plan. So does anybody have any questions? Council members, any questions? <coughs> I have a question. So would, would it be a, a operated as a nonprofit, or, or would you envision it maybe being like the rec center is for the city where the city would administer it? I guess I would envision it as a nonprofit, but the idea of having it be an alternate rec center has crossed our mind. And so there's a lot of that level of discussion, vision, and planning that would be very, very helpful to have with people from city council because there's a lot of ways that it could go. Um, in, in the reason it would be helpful for it to be something that is in the nonprofit level is that there's a lot of grants that are available for families and arts um, that we could you know, if we have a really good executive director, they'll be very creative and create lots of different re venues for for this. So, for instance, that's the basic plan up there, but there's a lot of other ideas like summer camp, summer arts camp, artists in residence, specific programs that create a specific art piece over time that people can, I mean, the sky is really the limit. So when you have a nonprofit, you can apply for a lot of those grants. Any other questions? I have a question. Maybe Brian and Aaron, you, or Mayor and Aaron, you can help me. We postponed something with the the owner of that building. What did we postpone? Yeah, so there is um, there is a development contract with Mr. Pedrelli. Okay. And that stated uh, he were to come back with a preliminary plan. Uh, wasn't able to make it. Um, we are we've been in contact with Mr. Pedrelli as I've been talking with Marcy about this. Okay. Um, St. Mary's project for the arts um, and he's fully aware and um, you know like Marcy said it wasn't a developer versus the arts group or anything like that um, in, in fact I would say it, I think he completely understood and um, that you know that word probably should get out there um, as Marcy had the meeting last week um, we're looking at amending that contract uh, to give for a, a few extra months um, I mean, the developer's agreement. Okay. Um, and we've had those discussions with Mr. Pedrelli, so that's kind of where we stand on that right now. So then it's his property yet, and he would be selling it? That is correct. It is his property. Yep. That's what I wanted. Yep. Okay, thank you. He'd either be selling it or he'd be developing, developing it. it. Okay. Right. right. Okay. Yeah. But if he doesn't develop it according to our approval, then the city can take it back? Is that correct? No, um, I believe it's, uh, and maybe Kathy, you can help me out here. There is a penalty, um, monetary penalty for not develop, developing it on, by a certain date or not coming forward with a plan by a certain date. And that is what we want to amend um, probably at the December 3rd meeting, to be honest, a couple weeks. When the, when the council worked with the prior owner, uh, it was... It was the plan of the city to not own that property. And so at no time was there ever a, a time where the city was going to own that property. 
And so we looked for a developer, went to the past owner, and requested that uh, he uh, basically donate it and, and sell it to the to the current owner. So, yeah. Any other questions or comments? Okay. Can, Marcy? Is it the questions and comments just for the council or for the... It is, just for the council. Okay. They had a public meeting last... Uh, last week. Last, last week year. where you could have made comments there. <laughs> thank you, Marcy. Okay, thank you very much. Yep. We'll, uh, we'll keep you advised, Marcy, on what our plans are. We've had some preliminary discussion at the staff level, the okay. mayor and the staff level, of how we want to proceed. So we'll certainly keep you informed on how we're working forward with that. Okay, thanks. All right. Thanks, Marcy. Okay, uh, next up... Uh, Oh, okay. All right. Yeah, you know, we have something. You're certainly allowed to leave if you want to, but uh, we have a proclamation that's going to be happening in just a few minutes that uh, the arts people might be interested in. Okay. So <laughs> you might want to hang around for that. <laughs> it's kind of cool. At least I think it is. Um, all right. Uh, so next up, uh, what we try to do in the month of December, of course, you know, we have two city council meetings each month, and I'll make this real brief. Uh, right now, we believe, uh, staff believes that they can get by with, and, and that might not be the proper way of saying it, but what, what I'm suggesting is, is that we do not hold the second meeting in December, that we can get all of our work done in, on December 3rd and not, uh, and not have a city council meeting on December 17th. Now, if you're okay with this, this is subject to call. I, I think last year, actually, we canceled it and ended up still having it because we had something that came up. So, But it, does anybody have any issues with that, council members? Okay. I'll make a motion before Paul does that we cancel the <laughs> December 17th meeting. All right. We have a motion second by it. Hackett. Second it. Second by Hagen. Uh, that uh, we council or we cancel December seventeenth, two thousand nineteen, uh, council meeting subject to call. Any discussion? All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Against. Motion carried. All right. Uh, we have a proclamation designating December second, two thousand nineteen, as Christmas Stamp Day in Wapaka. And actually, I and just a real brief history on it before I read the proclamation, but uh, uh, last week I received a call from an individual, his name was Craig Kogan, I think his name is, he lives in Oklahoma, and he's been doing some research with the uh, U.S. Postal Service and found out uh, some interesting information about Wapaka and the Christmas stamp, and hence that's why we have this proclamation. This proclamation was actually written by Sandy, so, uh, but I'll, I'll go ahead and read that. So this is a proclamation designating December 2nd, 2019 as Christmas Stamp Day in Wapaka, Wisconsin, whereas by 1950, a member of, a number of countries had issued stamps with the Christmas theme. These included Canada, Netherlands, Brazil, St. Pierre, I don't know how to pronounce the next one, Hungary and Austria. Cuba was the first country to issue Christmas stamps on an annual basis beginning in 1951. In 1957, Australia began issuing stamps for Christmas annually, whereas in 1958, Father Jules V. Simino assigned to the Blessed Sacrament Preparatory Seminary in Wapaka, Wisconsin, received a Christmas card from a friend in Australia. The stamp on the cover had an image of an activity center. He was so impressed by that stamp that he felt that the United States should also issue a stamp for Christmas. And whereas he shared his feeling with Father Michael S. Wisniewski, 
pastor of St. Mary's Magdalen Parish in Wapaka, who in turn passed it on to the parish's Legion of Mary organization. This organization, along with the local Knights of Columbus and the Junior Chamber of Commerce, the City Council, and the County Board started a letter writing campaign to convince the Post Office Department to issue a Christmas stamp. And whereas the U.S. Congressman Melvin R. Laird drafted a bill in 1959 that called for the Post Office Department to issue a Christmas stamp featuring the Nativity Center and stipulated that the stamp be placed on sale in Wapaka, Wisconsin. Congressman Laird was informed that the request for the commemorative stamp must be sent to the Postmaster General. If the stamp requested meets the criteria established for selection, it is then referred to the Citizen Stamp Advisory Committee. And whereas in 1962, the Postmaster General announced the decision to issue the Christmas stamp that year with the first printing of 862 million stamps quickly selling out and, and Christmas stamps become an annual event thereafter. Wow. Now, therefore, I, Brian Smith, Mayor of the City of Opaca, do hereby proclaim Monday, December 2nd, 2019 as Christmas stamp day in the City of Opaca. Oh. So isn't that cool? Yeah. Awesome. Mayor? Yeah. On that day, is it, do I understand that people can go to the post office and have mails stamped with that yeah. stamp? Yeah. Yeah, I should read the email, too. Let me read the email Thank that you. goes along with it. Yeah. I, I mean, I won't read the whole thing, but uh, it just says, Mayor Smith, thank you for visiting with me today. Attached is the article I referred to outlining the involvement of WPAC in the issuance of the first U.S. Christmas stamp, the first U.S. Christmas stamp. I'm requesting that the city council or the mayor, whichever is appropriate, designate Monday, December 2nd, 2019 as Christmas stamp day in Wapaka. In, in conjunction with this event, the citizens of Wapaka will be, would be able to get a special postmark from the post office recognizing the work done by Wapaka citizens in the effort to get a Christmas stamp. So huh. this is only if it goes through, which he has to then turn this proclamation into the Postmaster General, which he thinks he's done his work. He believes that that will happen. So pretty cool. And it did fit in with our St. Mary's discussion tonight, too, of course. I, I, I grew up uh, uh, at the Catholic Church, St. Mary's Church, and I remember Father Wisniewski and many of you some of us older ones also remember the the chain school used to be the seminary in town too where we had uh, priest there also so pretty interesting all right back to business <laughs> I need to... yeah i'll let you go now <laughs> <laughs> yeah you can stay as long as you want yeah. uh Actually, I think he wants a paper copy, so I have his address. Okay. I'll email you his address. Okay. Remind me, though. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Brian, did Father Wisniewski stay here, or did, because uh, up in Menominee, Michigan, there was a Father Wisniewski who, um, who I had as a pastor. You know, I don't know that for sure. I, I always thought that he retired here. Um, I mean, as a child, he seemed like he was seven feet tall, so oh, yeah. and old. <laughs> but he might not have been. You know? I, don't, I don't know. It yeah. just seems so, rather strange. It, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> public input. Okay. Next up, we have uh, public input. Uh, these are on non-agenda items. If we have anybody in the audience that would like to speak on a public input item, Please step up to the podium, give your name and address for the record, and your discussion must be three minutes or less. Okay. Uh, Randall Meyer, 205 South Division Street, Department 312, Wapaka, Wisconsin, 54981. Uh, first of all, I want to refer to uh, last week's uh, Wapaka County Post, uh, the November 14, 2019 issue, the article City Reviews 20. 
20 budget. The, um, a quote um, in that article said the mayor described the budget as business as usual. And mayor, I respect, respectfully disagree with your assessment of the budget. Uh, to sir, me, sir, business as usual. I'm going to stop you. That is a agenda item tonight, so move on to your next step. Okay. To me, business as usual in the city of Wapaka means if it's broken, don't fix Sir, it. Sir, I asked you to move on. To what? My, this is my You're topic. talking about the budget. The budget is, is an agenda item tonight. These are for non-agenda items. I said nothing. Okay. Um, so move on. To set the words I was just saying. Okay. To me, business as usual, this has nothing to do with the budget. To me, business well, as started usual. started by saying it had to do with the budget. That's my, that was the first paragraph. If you let me finish. To me, business as usual in the city of Wapaka means if it is broken, don't fix it. As far as I'm concerned, this is not good enough. This is not acceptable. It shouldn't be. The way I see it, the city of Wapaka is a lawless city. The city of Wapaka's laws, codes, ordinances should be well written and enforced. If not, they should be removed from the Wapaka, Wisconsin Code of Ordinances. Why, why, have, why have them if you are not going to enforce them? As we all know, if you don't enforce ordinances, people will keep violating them. Here's just a few examples of the ordinances, in my opinion, that aren't being enforced. The traffic code, 7013, speed limits, the only one I see is a sign that tells you how fast you're going. Then through highways, um, through highways here, let's see. Number three talks about operators to obey traffic control devices. More than, more than often I see uh, um, people ro do, doing rolling stops and running stop signs and, um, and stop lights and stop signs. Uh, 7 117 enforcement. Next, chapter 8, public works. 807, vehicles likely to damage streets restricted. Um, I won't read that, but I don't know. Uh, um, the way I see it, every semi, MS, every semi that drives through Wapaka can drive through Wapaka at any time, at any place. And that's not what the that's not what the ordinance uh, says. So that, to me, that's not being forced. That vehicles uh, are damaging the streets, and that's restricted. Then there's 809.9 .9, snow and ice removal. That's not the, that ordinance not, is not being uh, enforced. Chapter nine: Public peace and good order. 9.10: Loud and unnecessary prohibit. Not just before 7 a.m. or after 11 p.m. This is a noisy city, from noisy semis, noisy trucks, cars, motorcycles playing loud music. Um, and then chapter 10, going back to the public nuisances, 10.05, public nuisances affecting peace and safety that goes back to snow and ice removal. And I'm, I'm, I don't see that. I want you to know if these ordinances are not being enforced because the city, I, Here's my question to the council. I want to know if these ordinances are not being enforced because the city won't do it or if the city can't do it, meaning not enough city employees. Um, and this is a budget question and I should have read into it. Does the 2020 annual budget include the enforcement of the code of ordinances? I support two things though in the budget. I support the addition of the second public safety liaison offer for the drug problem in the Wapaka School District, and I support the addition of a drug officer for the drug problem in the city of Wapaka. And I'm a first-hand witness to that. I live over in Angeles Apartments, and I know there was an overdose death across the street from the hotel over there this summer, and I have been eyewitnesses to drug deals one, one block away at the hotel and at the Gunderson building. So where where sir, are you going? I'm sir. going to submit this for the record. Just give it Take to our look. city attorney then. Okay. Just step back. Mm -hmm. That's all I have to say. My three minutes are up. If anybody wants to talk to me after the council meeting, I'll be available. I do thank you for coming forward with your issues that you have. Um, 
I do hold office hours on Tuesday and Thursday. If you would like to sit down and discuss those, I'd be more than happy to do that. Any I, issues I, that you have? I've come, I've come during your business hours, and I've never... I, I wasn't asking you to talk. I was talking. Okay, I'm just saying. Okay, I know that you met with Aaron Jensen already. If you want to set up an appointment to meet with me, that would be great. But that's how we do it here. Thank you. And Thank you. Aaron Thank you. All right, uh, let's move on to our, uh, we have any other public input? Any other public input? I have a question. I'm representing the... Uh, Hold on. Hold on. Do you want to step up to the podium, please? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure when I'm supposed to do this, but... Sorry. I represent the Wapaka Area Arts and Culture Network, and I have... Uh, oh, yeah. Do I do that now, or am I coming up? Well, you're, you're coming up, but stand right there, because unless we have more public input. All right. You're doing well. All right. <laughs> any other public input? Anybody else that would like to give any other public input? All right, let's move on to Community Department Ed Reports. Our community member. Go ahead. Uh, hello. Uh, <clears throat> My name is Ian Teal, and I am the executive director of Wiga Arts Organization, also known as Wiga Arts. Uh, Wiga Arts owns and operates the Gerald Opera House in Wiga, which it purchased in 2007. Uh, thank you for allowing us to take this time to be here today in front of your council. Wiga Arts is a member of the Wapaka Area Arts and Culture Network that is a result of the Wapaka Cultural Plan that was initiated in 2018. I am here today representing the Wapaka Area Arts and Culture Network and to inform the council Council and to thank the Council for the continued support of the arts in our communities. <laughs> Excuse me, I'm fighting a cold. <clears throat> uh, Wyawiga is a small town of approximately 2,000 persons. Although our community has shown great support for Wiga Arts, our events could not survive without the support of our surrounding communities, including and most importantly, Wapaka. We have received multiple grants from the Wapaka Area Community Foundation. We regularly host the Wapaka Rotary Club's International Dinner, and, has also, and we have also received a grant from their organization. Excuse me. Uh, many students from the Wapaka School District have participated in our programs and workshops, and we have collaborated, collaborated on projects with the Wapaka Community Arts Board. Very important are the patrons attending our events from Wapaka. Although our audience comes from many communities in the area, our statistics have shown that Wapaka provides the largest percentage. Wiga Arts presents concerts, plays, and musicals. We regularly host workshops for youth in different creative fields, including filmmaking, theater, theater games, and improvisation, and songwriting. Our largest annual event is the Wiga International Film Festival. This past weekend, we held our ninth annual film festival. We'd have, we had over 400 in attendance over the course of four days. Many attendees pur purchased festival passes and were in attendance for three or more days of the festival. We invited many filmmakers to the festival for which Wiga Arts provides local housing. Uh, we had a few celebrities, including Mark Metcalf, who some of you may know as Niedemeyer from Animal House or the Maestro from Seinfeld. Uh, actresses Tally Medell and Norma Cooling were in attendance to, to present their award-winning film they star in 14. Norma is one of the stars of the CBS show Chicago Med. Also joining us was Domenica Cameron Scorsese, daughter of the famed director Martin Scorsese. Domenica was here to present a film she recently starred in Black Flowers. As Why Wiga has no hotels, we house all of our filmmakers here in Wapaka. We booked 10 rooms at the Comfort Suites, and we had the Green Fountain Inn entirely booked for the, for the entire weekend. Along with our actors, I know of several other festival attendees who came from out of town and stayed in the Wapaka area. I would imagine that dollars were spent elsewhere in town, and I know that Little Fat Gretchen's was well attended by some of our guests. While, event, while our event is now passed, we have many. <clears throat> while our event is now passed, we have many other upcoming events, including a concert with Steve March Torme and Michael Bailey, Vic Ferrari on January 17th, and our annual Mardi Gras bash with Copper Box on February 15th. We're also starting a new annual project, a short film made with youth from Wapaka and Waiwiga and surrounding communities. We will be visiting the high school to talk about it. It will start with script development. 
We get Arts will be advertising these events on the January water bill for Wapaka, and we greatly appreciate this opportunity that the city is providing to help us get the word out. WEGA Arts feels that arts and culture are an important part of any society. We especially feel that engaging and educating youth in the arts is one of the most important aspects of creating a new and better community in which to live. We may plant the seed that inspires the next Pablo Picasso, Steve Jobs, or Martin Scorsese. At this time, WEGA Arts is not seeking any financial support from the city of Wapaka. We are in the process of budgeting the film project and we will keep you posted. We greatly appreciate the time and consideration that this council has taken to provide platforms and support for all, for all artistic endeavors in our communities. Thank you all for your time, and if you have any questions, I'd be glad to take them. Anybody have any questions or comments? Thank you. Thanks. Right. Thank you. All right, uh, let's uh, move on to our Department head reports, and we'll start with Kathy, our finance director. Thank you, Mayor. Good evening, council members. My report was um, uploaded later, um, working on the budget. I try and get my report in, and I just don't get it into the packet in time. Um, again, we continue to work on information for the tax bills. Uh, we are now looking at um, placing the delinquent water and sewer bills on the tax roll and any outstanding invoices or charges that um, are uh, property related that will also be placed on the tax bills. So we're working on that. We're working on putting um, all of the pieces together. Uh, we have all the levies information, but um, again, we're waiting for the first dollar in lottery credits to be posted tomorrow from the state. Uh, we've worked uh, with our external auditors for setting the dates. Um, this year, our preliminary audit will be uh, January 22nd, and our final audit will be February 24th. So again, we should have some final numbers for you in March so that we can get the uh, public service report done by April 1st and the state report, financial report done by May 15th. So uh, we're working on that. We did have one of the taxi vehicles uh, involved in an accident, and I did hear uh, since my report did go online that uh, it is being repaired and we do not need um, to purchase another vehicle. Um, the Wellness Committee received the results of the PHA screenings from uh, the city employees and st uh, spouses on the health insurance plan. Uh, we're going to be focusing on tobacco use and uh, healthy weight. So those are our um, two focuses for next year, and we'll be working with Theta Care at Work on uh, programs to help our employees remain healthy, and hopefully we'll have maybe third year with no health insurance. So that's all I have. Awesome. Kathy, thank you. Any comments, questions? Let's go on over to the library. Peg? Thank you, Mayor Smith. Um, so we continue our community connectedness uh, effort with a community read deepening community and there are books available at the library and there is a list inside of the books of the remaining discussions that you can join in after you've read the book. Um, we are uh, putting our strategic plan into our working plan at this time and we'll be asking the library board to increase our hours on Fridays um, one extra hour till 6 p.m. as well as eliminating overdue fees for children's and teen items um, and taking a look back and making sure that those overdue fees that may affect kids um, are limited as well. So you're gonna be seeing those um, exciting things happening at the library. We're really uh, working on access and making sure that our building is available and that it's barrier free in terms of the policies and procedures that we have in place. Um, so we're very happy to um, be moving forward our strategic plan, and I hope to be able to present that strategic plan to the council early in December, since we have one meeting December. All right. Thanks, Peg. Any questions, comments? <coughs> All right. Uh, let's go to public works here. Justin. Thank you, Mayor. My memo or update, excuse me, can be seen on page 1920 within the packet. 
Uh, within the wastewater, we submitted our design drawings and specifications to the DNR for review uh, for our aeration project. That's where we want to replace a blower and then also some of our uh, diffusers within our tanks. Uh, we're working on the comments we've received from them. Uh, so we're working on that request. It's going to take a little bit of time, um, but we're still on schedule. Uh, speaking of DNR, we received our latest uh, uh, pollution discharge elimination permit from them. That's our permit that we work underneath of on a five-year cycle. Uh, it was just renewed. Uh, for the most part, our permit from the last cycle to this cycle has stayed the same. Uh, there was some increase uh, in some of our testing frequencies uh, so that we, in response to that, have increased our lab budget uh, and chemical use to make sure that we meet uh, those requirements. Uh, we've been put on notice that in the future they can adjust um, certain limits within our permit pretty much at any time. Uh, and the one that everybody's been talking about is phosphorus. I've talked about it here before. Uh, so this current permit or the newest one, our phosphorus limit has stayed the same. Um, but before this five years is up, we're most likely going to see a change, a uh, more stringent limit uh, to that. But uh, it's something we can work with uh, and work towards in the future. We still uh, have the, the, the big uh, vector uh, truck out there jetting sewers, uh, jetting storm sewers, even though it's cold out, we're still running that machine. Uh, we've battled several snow events. Um, pretty early, at my short tenure here, the first snowfall is the earliest I've seen. Uh, and I, I, from what I understand was um, one of the earliest in, in recent memory. Uh, we had our annual uh, snow meeting just so happened to be on the first day of snow. Uh, so that was quite a coincidence. <coughs> uh, Main Street, we have that annual meeting later than <laughs> <or> next year. <laughs> One year we had it in uh, was it February. <laughs> But I think it was one of them things, the day that we planned to do it, it was too big, we had to put it off, and we kept putting it off, putting it off, so. Anyways, uh, <clears throat> Main Street, we do have an update for you. Uh, we have submitted our plans and have received some comments back from the State Historical Preservation Office. Uh, the, we're reviewing those comments and adjusting as necessary on that. Uh, we have penciled in a third public information meeting uh, for January 13th. We haven't set a time on that yet, but we'll work on an agenda and materials. Uh, so come January, mid-January, we're gonna have one more uh, public meeting, at least one more uh, for Main Street. Granite Street, not much of an update. Uh, haven't really made much progress on that. Uh, on my side, just waiting for the designers to come back with something to review. Uh, the salt shed, uh, the contractor is on board. They're actually looking to start pretty soon uh, out breaking ground at Habercorn. Uh, what we're doing right now is making sure that whatever concrete they pour during the winter time is gonna be uh, properly protected and won't be exposed to the cold weather. So we're working through that before we give them the green light, but that could be starting maybe before the end of the month. Leaf pickup, uh, we've extended that uh, pickup schedule internally. We're going to go to the end of the month, so if you still have leaves out there, get them out. Uh, we had such weird weather, and the leaves didn't want to cooperate at the very beginning. Uh, I'm getting calls every single day on that, but we are making another round, so get them leaves out this weekend, and we'll get them next week. Tegan Noltner, our most recent hire, recently passed his CDL exam, so he was hired without a CDL. He Got that with flying colors and almost no time flat. Uh, so we're really happy for him. Uh, <clears throat> we received another tree grant, this time uh, from the DNR, a canopy catastrophe grant, which was in response to the, to the storms that happened in July. Uh, we were one of several communities that uh, received this. So we we're getting an amount of $8,500. Uh, we're having a meeting set up in a, in a few weeks here. Uh, <clears throat> The DNR is holding that meeting. I'm going to be attending to make sure whatever we apply for this grant does not conflict with the FEMA 
uh, grant that Kathy and I have been working on and she will be submitting on. <clears throat> we installed several new LED lights on the back side of Rec Center, so we improved our lighting back there and our energy usage. Um, and finally, uh, Chief Hosell, myself, uh, Officer Zuby, uh, working with the school district, the county sheriff, go right way to address concerns with some of the intersections around the schools uh, at those various times when school is let in and let out. Uh, had a, a really good brainstorming session on how to make some improvements. Uh, so what we're looking to do at the intersection of Churchill and Riverside is restrict the left turn onto Park uh, Avenue. What did I say? Riverside. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Churchill Street and Park, the left turn from Churchill to Park, thank you, Chief, uh, to, to restrict that movement, because that, what we have seen is people that want to turn left there can't because it's so congested. It backs up through the Riverside intersection and basically just shuts down everything. Uh, so once we started temporarily restricting that, traffic flowed a lot better. Uh, you know, for an intersection has issues for basically two one hour periods a day, it's really bad and a simple sign has darn near uh, solved the whole thing. So we're looking to make that more permanent into the future. Um, I think we're gonna have one more meeting coming up here, uh, but get the word out for those who go through that area, please don't take that left turn on to park um, during those times. Thank you, Justin. Any questions, comments for Justin? All right, Parks and Rec, Andrew. Sure. Thanks, Mayor, Council Members. Um, starting, we'll start in the parks. Um, the baseball board has again uh, agreed to help us uh, make some upgrades in Swan Park this year. Um, they recently ordered a, another shade structure uh, that will go in between fields one and two. So those are the first two uh, that you see there. Um, and the cost uh, with insulation is upwards of about $20,000. So they're making that donation and we'll uh, work with the company to try to get that going. So again, um, they're always very supportive. I know the girls softball board will be uh, making some donations as well. And I just wanted to make you aware of uh, the good things that are happening at our parks because of these groups um, that are helping us with that. Uh, also on the donation uh, front, we have a new scoreboard up at Lakeman Field just got put up this week. Um, you'll want to go check that out. It's a very nice scoreboard. Um, those were donations made by Ken Dayton uh, in memory of his late wife. Um, the Pack of Foundry and Farmer's State Bank. Um, we'll have some sort of ceremony in the spring once the Lakemen start up um, to make sure that we, um, you know, recognize those uh, donors. Uh, the signs for smoking actually late this afternoon got a draft of what we're thinking about putting up, and I'll be taking that to Park Board. But uh, the no smoking signs. Um, like the ATV and UTV signs probably won't get put up until the spring when uh, the weather clears a little bit. So we'll continue moving on that. Uh, administration wise, uh, I've been continuing to meet with the middle school um, science teachers to work uh, on how we can better utilize Eco Park. We're already starting to formulate some plans for a spring field day, uh, an astronomy night, possibly, and then some things in the fall. So I've been working with Josh in IT to work on some um, internet stuff out there and making a few other improvements um, so that we can get that park utilized by the schools. I think that's gonna be a great partnership moving um, forward as we, as we move forward. We'll continue in the spring with our programming from the uh, youth center staff as far as getting families engaged. I know last year we had a very, very successful uh, mother-daughter ball where Miss Wisconsin came in and talked to the girls. Um, we're looking at doing um, some sort of father-son slash family activity um, this spring in March. And I've actually reached out to um, uh, some pretty big names in the uh, outdoor industry to try to figure out if I can make something happen to get one of them here uh, to come talk and try to get people outdoors and in the community and um, you know just engaged in nature again. So I'll continue updating people on that as we move forward. Recreation-wise, we're in basketball, uh, beginner and intermediate basketball. 
Uh, they practice after school, and then on Saturdays they come in and get to work with the uh, high school team, which is a great partnership again with the with the school. Senior Center is having a Thanksgiving meal for members this Thursday uh, at 11:30. Um, that's you know, not everyone has a, a family that they get to spend time with for Thanksgiving or have an opportunity to have a nice Thanksgiving meal. Um, so this is just an opportunity for them to get together, to converse, and uh, have a good time. The PALS grant class is wrapping up their first of two. I've talked about that in the past. That was a, a big grant to get people in our community who are otherwise not active to be active. Um, and that's going well. And then a new thing that the Senior Center is doing, uh, they've created a, a program called Cheer Boxes. Um, and what they're doing is people or members are donating items such as gift cards, care items, tacky, taxi vouchers. Um, and what they're doing is they're going to put those together in boxes. And members and people of the community can nominate um, you know, seniors in our community who are uh, either alone or uh, just had a rough year that they know about or financially are struggling a little bit. And what staff's going to do is they're going to take and deliver these cheer boxes to those people in our community um, to help brighten up their uh, holiday season. So I think that's a great thing that the seniors are doing. And uh, I look forward to maybe trying to expand that or grow that in our community uh, as we move forward. Um, lastly, tonight on a personal note, you can see this sweet mustache I'm wearing here uh, for this month. And I know the mayor commented on last year, if you remember, kind of gave me a little bit of hard time about it. Um, so what this is, is uh, not me trying to look good because my wife tells me every day that it doesn't look good, but uh, Movember is what it's called and it is about uh, men's health awareness. And I just wanted to make sure that everyone knows why uh, people are doing this in, in November. And so, um, you know, what it's for is men's health, such as prostate cancer, uh, testicular cancer, and suicide. And it's a, it's a program to bring awareness. Um, my best friend's father died from prostate cancer, and that's why we do it uh, every year. So if you're of age, please get tested. Uh, and if you haven't seen your doctor for a long time, make sure you go see your doctor because uh, it doesn't uh, take very long. It happens really quick, uh, as we learned in that situation uh, with my friends. So um, make sure you get tested, and I will continue to grow cheesy, sleazy-looking mustaches each year uh, if I can bring awareness to that fact. So I uh, just wanted to make that an announcement as well. That's all I have. Thank you, sir. Thanks, Andrew. Mm -hmm. I'm glad I didn't say anything this year. <laughs> <laughs> Chief Ozell. Thank you, Mayor. My report can be found on page 26. Um, we're in the middle of our hiring process right now for our officers. Um, they're going to start interviews tomorrow. We have um, 10 real good candidates um, that we're going to be interviewing, and um, they're going to pass that on to me with interviews coming up in early December. So at our commission meeting, uh, we're, we'll be looking at um, two or three different people and then going on from there with background checks. So we're hoping to have somebody on board at the beginning of the year. Um, also, with that addition of the second officer, we've been in communication with the school district in regards to a therapy dog. Um, the idea behind that is of building relationships with the kids in school, um, of them being able to come up and talk to the officers. Um, we're looking right now at Wes Zuby as to getting his dog trained as to become the therapy dog. Um, there's other communities that do have this. Um, we've heard nothing but really good things. Um, up in Wausau, they had a few problems with a student, and as soon as they brought the dog in, the student calmed down, and they were able to take the situation under control. So that's something if we can get it to go through, we're probably looking at the end of April or beginning of May when um, Officer Zuby can bring the dog in with the formal training. Um, the other thing is we just had the uh, drug, drug take back on October 26. We took in 51.4 pounds of prescription medication, which was up a little bit from 49.6 pounds last year at this time. So there's still a lot of 
items that are out there in people's households and we're glad that they're turning them in and we're disposing them in a safe manner. Um, also coming up on December 5th is going to be Shop with a Cop and that's something that the Sheriff's Department started and all the law enforcement agencies and Wapaka County get involved with. So officers will get together with some kiddos and take them out to Fleet Farm and they'll look at um, getting gifts for the rest of the families. So and that event always takes place over at the rec center. Um, so they're able to go back there, spend some time with the officers, eat some pizza and get their gifts wrapped. So that's a really great program that's going on. And then lastly here, um, our department along with the police commission adopts a family every year for Christmas and we work with um, Lori Chestnut in regards to doing that. We've been doing that a lot, a long time, Lori. A long time. And we've made some differences in people's Christmases every year. Sometimes we're able to adopt two families depending upon how many children that they do have. So that's something that's real good. I'm glad that we continue and I appreciate you always helping us out for that. Well, it makes not just Christmas, it changes them overall, you know, the spirit of giving. So Absolutely. There's a, such good results from that. Thank you so much. Yes, and actually there's one more thing. Um, going along with Justin, I talked about that no left turn earlier. Some of you may see school buses coming through town. Um, we're trying to provide a safer way of the school buses getting out to the high school instead of stacking up onto the ramp. And we know this spring that Highway 10, they're going to be doing some bridge work, and it's going to be down to one lane up there. So right now we're doing some different testing in regards to bringing them through town. Um, they're coming down School Street onto Lake Street and then out South Main Street out to the school. And we're really trying to minimize the amount of time that the buses are on the off-ramp. So if you do notice some buses going through town, um, that's why we're doing it. We're just trying to make it safer for everybody that's involved. Because if you go out there right now and you look, we could have... 14 buses on the ramp at one time and it just really backs up and if we don't have an officer that's there if they're tied up in a call it's really hard for those buses to get it get back onto the road so that's all i have mayor great thank you chief any questions comments for the chief all right uh josh okay um been busy we did uh, upgrades on the wireless uh, the wi-fi in our three main buildings update the system to current standards um, the previous system was six seven years old and quite out of date um, we did some pretty big upgrades in the community media area we reorganized and rebuilt the radio studio with some furniture from storage that fit better in the room to make it uh, more usable um, the tv station we made some final upgrades you notice not as many cameras in here anymore um, things are a little different now, which makes taping the meetings uh, nicer. Um, all the programming we're doing is now finally in HD, about you know, 15 years after that became a thing. So everything you see online now, you can see whose mouth is moving. Uh, programming looks a lot better. The cable TV station itself is still analog, and that's probably never going to change. But everything, all of our, the other ways we distribute on our website and YouTube um, as of this month look a lot better. We got our new copiers that were approved back in September. We got those uh, yesterday. I haven't had any complaints so far, so I think that's a good sign, uh, working a lot quicker, and we're all up to date across the board on that. And I'm currently working through a project just to get through the city website, um, just giving it some good maintenance, removing duplicate information. You know, we've been finding that some stuff that's maybe outdated that we don't need on there, maybe some new things we should have on there. Um, once the new logo gets finalized, I'll be working on getting that on there and just just making some minor changes and updates on there. So that's something I'm working through and have been working with some staff and some departments on things I'm not quite sure about with their expertise to make sure we're, we've got everything good in good shape on our website. All right. Thanks, Josh. Comments? Questions? Let's go to Sandy. Thanks, Mayor Smith. My report can be found on pages 47 and 48. Um, last month, I provided you with an update, or I explained how we had this massive open records request from this attorney regarding Ruby's Pantry. Well, we completed the work. Um, wages and time came to $710.52. The attorney um, 
argued it was too expensive. And after discussion, it was decided that he didn't want the emails that we included. So we removed the emails and charged him $443. Uh, payment was received and we released the information. Um, also with the potential reorganization of the Planning and Development Office, um, Barb Robert and I have been purging the file system database in our, in our office to try to find more room for cubicles or offices. And um, I'll be out of the office Thursday and Friday this week in uh, Green Bay for the 2019 Presidential Election Academy e-briefing. And it's um, through the UW Green Bay and held at the Hyatt Regency. And the, um, I only issued one temporary Class B license, picnic license, for the Wapaka Fine Arts Festival that was on October 19th. And uh, the rest is informational. All right. Any questions, comments for Sandy? Thanks, Sandy. Aaron. Thank you, Mayor Smith. First, I want to say um, Josh with Sandy with Josh's new HD cameras, we have to stop picking our nose up here. <laughs> Run, I'll see everything. Uh, um, all right. <laughs> monthly report. My this monthly. Is the first I've heard of it, too, you guys. <laughs> My uh, my monthly report is on page 49 in your packets. Um, just want to give a quick uh, kind of spotlight on some economic development uh, updates. We'll pack a foundry. The final inspection has been done on their large four-story um, addition. Uh, Young Drive, we have a new house on Young Drive, and occupancy was granted on November 11th. Um, Dunkin' Donuts, we have a revised structural drawing. Um, that has been, well, has been revised, uh, looking at the elevation changes needed for that building. Premier Commercial Drive Estates, those are the apartments out in the Eastgate subdivision. Uh, building two, three, and four have been granted occupancy, and the other building is behind because of storm damage. That one was hit the hardest. Um, we have had some conversations with the owners of the Par 4 Resort and Comfort Suites. Uh, they're looking at a possible expansion. Um, of the hotel and banquet, and we would also add a banquet hall. So uh, we're in the preliminary stages of those conversations, but we'll continue to talk to them about that. We, we've also learned uh, from the property owner at 1015 and 1025 West Fulton Street uh, that she has received some interest in both of her lots. Those would be across from where the new Duncan Donuts building is going. Um, we don't have a ton of information on that as of now, but we will certainly share it as, as things materialize. So that's just a brief update from an econ development standpoint. Um, also wanted to touch on a few other things that we sent out an RFP for elevation surveys for buildings located in the floodplain between North Main Street and Cooper Street. Um, that is to shoot elevations on the buildings. We, we have um, building owners that are subject to very high insurance rates. If they're looking to sell a building to anyone who wants, who is interested in that area, uh, financing is very hard because of being in the floodplain. After looking at floodplain maps, speaking with people that have dealt with this, uh, there are a number of buildings that they feel the elevation could possibly bring them those buildings out and help with those costs, help with development in the downtown area. Um, so we just sent an RFP out to a number of, uh, of um, surveyors that do that work, and those are due at uh, this Thursday at 4 p.m., so you'll be likely seeing something soon on that. Um, 2020 census, uh, so Sandy and I will be working on that along with uh, Peg and Andrew. Um, we are, actually we have a meeting with uh, one of the representatives from the census. Uh, actually it's stationed out of Chicago, but he's ironically from Wapaka. He'll be coming here next Tuesday. Uh, it's, a lot of that's done at the county level. Um, and the reason it's so important is, as you guys probably know, a lot of our federal funding, state funding, all of that counts um, on us getting everyone we can counted. Um, so we will be assisting. The big change this year is online um, formats for collecting that information. So the reason uh, the library and rec center are involved, we're gonna set up some kiosks or some workstations uh, for people who maybe don't have access at home to come in and do that uh, there. And then we'll also be promoting it through Josh and his tools and hopefully the paper and radio and so on and so forth. Um, Staff right now is administering performance evaluations through the end of December uh, from a supervisory level. Uh, you guys, and I put this in our newsletter, weekly newsletter, I'm still waiting to hear back, but you guys will be seeing something soon on uh, the city administrator's um, evaluation and that process. 
Uh, upcoming meetings, uh, already touched on one of them, uh, Justin did. The Main Street informational meeting, January 13th. At, um, and I, yeah, I have 6 p.m., but Justin's right. I don't think we set that in stone um, yet. So a time and exact location will come to you soon. Um, comp plan and zoning updates. Um, meetings for that. December 4th is a regular plan commission meeting, so we'll be meeting at 515. That one's really meant for plan commission members and staff, but anyone's really, as always, invited. Then January 6th um, is the community workshop for rezoning, and that's going to be a long meeting. That's at the Danes home. Uh, we anticipate two to three hours. Um, again, 6 o'clock, January 6th, um, and that one's for the, the general public. Uh, we are looking, uh, I believe, this one's tomorrow, HR trainings. So we're just looking to have something um, structured for all of our required HR trainings, whether it's, uh, you know, uh, sexual harassment or anti-discrimination or um, ethics fraud training, things like that. Uh, we're meeting, uh, Kathy and I are meeting with, um, which group is it? Remind me. The Horton Group. The Horton Group. Thank you. They provide uh, this as free services. What we're looking to do is we're looking to get a, like an online platform that can be easily done by all city employees when we have the in-person provides value. Um, and we kind of want a combination of that. So in-person and online, we can't always get every city employee. And we feel like it's important enough to go through that training on an annual basis. So probably be hearing more about that. Um, wanted to touch on uh, meetings. Uh, we'll pack a growth as we're terming it. Um, so myself, uh, school superintendent, Ron Sari, um, Dave Teal, and um, Terry from the chamber, Terry Schultz, uh, are working on um, just starting a conversation with our local business leaders um, and Fox Valley Tech and all community organizations on strategies we can come up with and put in place and work together and collaborate on uh, to kind of beat the numbers that do exist in rural communities right now which is flatlining population, or in some cases, decreasing population. So we're trying to have conversations on how we can collaborate on beating those trends here in Wapaka, as we know how vital that is to um, providing the services we need for our current residents um, and staying financially healthy. Um, the last thing I wanna to touch on, ATV, um, UTV and the smoking ordinance was published on Thursday. Uh, last Thursday, um, working with Rhonda in our office, um, we are going to be putting a map for the ATV routes um, that basically will show where they are not allowed either per the downtown area in our ordinance or per state statute on those county road or high, um, state routes uh, that are over 35 miles an hour. So it'll just be a map showing. We've gotten quite a few questions on that so far. So hopefully we can just drive them to that link um, and they can get a clear picture of that. So. That is uh, everything for my report, Mayor. All right. Thanks, Aaron. Any questions, comments for Aaron? All right. Uh, let's move on then to uh, unfinished business. This has to do with our uh, city strategic planning contract, uh, Aaron. Yeah. Thank you, Mayor Smith, again. Um, memo. The memo is on page 85 in your packet. And as you guys, I know you all remember, um, in May of last year, you guys had a strategic planning effort with uh, Mr. Walter Jankowski, uh, something led by Mr. Veliker at the time, and department heads and council members were all um, involved in that. I've been able to review some of that, the results from that, and it was really, really good information. Uh, it just wasn't quite finished. Uh, we're going to try to pick up where we left off, uh, and a couple things we want to gather as we pick this back up is... Um, so a little more uh, public input from a focus group standpoint. Uh, also want to get kind of an overarching, you know, we right now it felt like some of the information was a little bit, and, you know, it's great to have a roadmap for the IT department or public safety or public works. I uh, want to get that overarching um, direction, and we'll do that kind of by benchmarking our city along, uh, to other cities. That how do we spend our resources? How do we spend our time? Um, where do we stack up against comparable cities? So we'll add that in there. And then also um, just an accountability measure, so a reporting mechanism are the things we want to focus on. We don't want this to take six, eight months. Um, most of the work is already done. We envision this taking maybe two months and then hopefully having uh, that, that final draft to come to you guys for, for approval. Um, so 
It's, uh, I think it's, what do I have? I don't have my memo up. Is it 3,600, does it say in that memo? 35. 35. Yeah. So, so I guess this would come out of the, two th the city administrator's budget uh, in 2020, uh, it'd be paid for. Um, and we do have that plan for, so I guess I'd be asking for approval of that contract to finish up the work for an amount not to exceed $3,500. So moved. Second. Second. Motion by Hagan, second by Martin, that we approve entering into a uh, city strategic planning contract with Walter Janikowski for an amount not to exceed $3,500. Any discussion? Sandy will call the roll. Steve Hackett. Aye. Lori Chestnut. Aye. Paul Hagan. Aye. Scott Prochatsky. Aye. Dave Peterson. Aye. Paul Mayo. Aye. Dimitri Martin. Aye. Mary Fair. Aye. And Eric Olson. Aye. Nine ayes. Motion carried. Thanks, Aaron. Next up, uh, we have ordinance number 0519. This is actually the second reading of that ordinance. This is amending various provisions of the municipal code relating to license and permit fees, establishing fees for municipal services, and repealing license and fees that are no longer required or issued. Again, as I said, this is a second reading. Anybody need a summary of uh, what, what Sandy explained to you at the last meeting? Anybody? I'll make a motion we approve. Okay, we have a motion by Hackett. I'll second. Second by Chestnut that the council approves ordinance number 0519. Uh, this is an ordinance amending various provisions of the municipal code relating to license and permit fees, establishing fees for other municipal service and repealing license and fees that are no longer required or issued. Discussion? Say new color roll. Eric Olson. Aye. Mary Fair. Aye. Dimitri Martin. Aye. Paul Mayo. Aye. Dave Peterson. Aye. Scott Prochatsky. Aye. Paul Hagen. Aye. Lori Chestnut. Aye. And Steve Hackett. Aye. Nine ayes. Motion carried. Okay, another ordinance that uh, is a second reading. This is Ordinance 1319 2019, and this has to do with uh, repealing and recreating Section 1226 of the Weights and Measures Program. Uh, again, this is a second reading. Anybody need an update on? On that, otherwise we'd be looking for a motion to approve. Move to approve. Second. Motion by Olson, second by Martin, that we approve of Ordinance 1319-2019, an ordinance repealing and recreating Section 12.26 of the Weights and Measures Program. Any discussion? Sandy will call the roll. Dimitri Martin. Aye. Steve Hackett. Aye. Eric Olson. Aye. Dave Peterson? Aye. Mary Fair? Aye. Lori Chestnut? Aye. Paul Mayo? Aye. Scott Prochatsky? Aye. And Paul Hagen? Aye. Nine ayes. Motion carried. All right. Thank you, Sandy. Uh, under uh, new business, we have a couple of ordinances there also. Uh, the first one is ordinance number 0819-2019. This is an ordinance amending section 17.310 for signs of the municipal code of the city of Wapaka. Aaron? Yeah, so this is, if you guys remember last meeting, uh, there was a public hearing on this. This is really just an administrative duty. Uh, when the county building uh, was put up, this new district was created, and this just wasn't added in, the signs regulations. Um, so this is just uh, just doing that, accomplishing that, um, and pretty pretty straightforward. All right, and this is the first reading, so you'll see this at our next scheduled meeting, which is December 3rd, if I remember right. Okay, so next one, the next ordinance is also a first reading. Uh, this is ordinance number 1219-2019. This is an ordinance to amend the City of Opaki Year 2030 Comprehensive Plan. Aaron, you want to just repeat what you said at the public? Yep. Um, so this is, again, state statutes as we're considering a rezone in that area to allow for um, the Timber Ridge apartments. Uh, state statutes 
requires us to also have that zoning match the comprehensive plan. Um, and this is what that is doing is to, uh, to match that. Okay. Uh, that is the first reading of this ordinance. So we'll take that up at our next meeting. One more ordinance, first reading. This is ordinance 1419. Uh, this is amending section 17.201 parent two of chapter 17 of the municipal code of the city of Opaca entitled amendments to district maps to facilitate the development of SCS Timber Ridge Apartments LLC development project and to place certain requirements on the project per the preliminary plan review process and list the parcels pretty self-descriptive. Anything you want to add to that, Aaron? Um, not really. Uh, same thing, as I said, I guess, in the public hearing. Um, yeah, uh, they're just applying to make this amendment. Uh, they have two 16-unit multifamily, three eight-unit multifamily that they're proposing. Um, every, all of, you know, everything they've uh, communicated with staff meets everything within the R3 zoning district, which is what we're looking at. Um, so really nothing besides that. Okay, uh, next up, uh, these are, what's on your agenda here, um, I don't know that we're really looking for a motion in this area, but uh, before we pass the budget, uh, Kathy is going to get us up to date on, on the changes that uh, this budget has uh, compared to previous budgets. So, Kathy, go ahead. Thank you, Mayor. Again, just at what we had discussed um, or presented at the Committee of the Whole, the 2020 budget includes the funding uh, for the uh, second police school liaison officer, um, and which of 75% is being funded from the school district. So, um, that you will see in the police department budget that there is uh, an increase for that position. And you also will see in the intergovernmental uh, charges uh, revenue line that there's an increase there. And that has to do with, um, with the funding from the school district. But it's also hard to see because the offset from the uh, youth program fund um, mitigates a little bit of that, that those dollars. Um, there is no increase in the group health insurance rates for employees in the city. Um, this is our second year that we've uh, had a 0% increase. There are slight increases in Wisconsin retirement system contribution <coughs> rates, um, about 0.25%. It's a very minimal um, increase. It, in the retirement system contributions. Um, the budget does include a 3% cost of living increase to uh, all city employees except for seasonals and the custodial staff, which is just getting a flat $50 per hour increase. 50 cents. Oh, I'll take that. 50 cents. Oh, sorry, 50 right cents. That's okay. I was looking at a dollar sign and going, yeah, okay. Well, you guys are paying attention. I told her to put that in there. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Lots of numbers running through my head. Sorry. Um, it's okay. Automatic representative salary increase for those that will be elected and taking office after the April 2020 election is uh, fourth, up to 4,850 from 3,766, I believe it is. Um, the mayor's salary increase after uh, the April 2020 election would go to um, 12,250 from, I believe, 9,700 about. And then um, there is some reorganization in the community services department. However, uh, there, there is no budget impact to that department. It's using whatever funds were budgeted uh, from last year. Uh, there will be a promotion 
uh, requested for um, our Robert uh, to deputy clerk effective one one uh, with a salary adjustment uh, with for seven thousand four hundred dollars and we will be bringing a job description it's in the packet it's, it in, there. it's in the packet okay um, made Sandy look good okay um, there is a half year funding for a police drug officer uh, at a cost of 37,875. Uh, again, this is probably uh, by June 1st that we would uh, be hiring this uh, employee. The increase in the tax levy is in accordance with the levy limits, which is $33,036. Um, we did receive an increase in transportation aids of $55,368. And we are looking at increasing uh, what we are receiving and building, projecting for building permit fees and interest earnings, uh, each at $25,000 more than what uh, prior year's budget. So there's about $50,000 uh, of additional revenue for that. And that the budget would need a transfer from fund balance of $43,681. Uh, I haven't. I have received some questions from um, elected officials, but um, otherwise I haven't received any other comments. All right, uh, before we talk a little bit more about the uh, the budget, uh, let's, anybody have any questions on anything specific to the budget or any comments on, especially the items that Kathy just went over? Mayor, could I have a, a vote on the job description for deputy clerk? What we're going to do here um, in council, um, I'm, we're going to piggyback this basically off of what uh, Alderperson Keelan had suggested that the last meeting that uh, any of the personnel moves that we make uh, are going to be acted on as separate items. And so tonight you are passing a budget, okay, with those dollar amounts in there, but you are not approving the individual position, uh, and we're going to do that at the December 3rd meeting. So, for example, um, even though you're putting the $7,400 in there for the deputy clerk, you are not approving that deputy clerk position until December 3rd. So we're okay. trying to make it just real clean once once finance and once personnel there's there are two different things so we thought that would work best especially with the number of items that we're doing here too so what you're saying is is even though you're passing the budget you're not authorizing these significant changes as it relates to personnel okay so you understand so my understanding and I talked to Kathy was the dollar amount is kind of what we're voting on. If we decide to change around some of these personnel items, the dollar amounts will go to another fund or stay. Remember what we discussed? I, it just runs just... through the income statement. So okay. it, it'll just run through the budget to the bottom line if you don't spend it. Okay. We haven't had a whole lot of di uh, discussion. I mean, we've had quite a bit of discussion on all of these changes, and I've I haven't heard of any anybody so far that has said that they're they don't like any of the concepts that are here. I, again, just to be more transparent, we wanted to separate those two for personnel from finance. That's basically all we're doing. Right, and I also wanted to to add that um, with this half year funding of the drug officer, our anticipation is, is there isn't going to be, the funds are going to be there to continue that position from all our projections that we're, we're anticipating. So it's not like I'm only going to hire a drug officer for six months. So I am looking at that the uh, possibility of, um, having the levy capacity next year uh, or the budget capacity within the departments um, going forward for 2021 
that the money will be available to fund that position at 100%. Okay. I have a question. Yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry. Um, uh, with the fund balance transfer 43,681, does that significantly impact our reserve that we have? It brings us in compliance with our fund balance. Our fund balance as of last year is about 28%, and we have it that it it shouldn't be more than 25. So we're we're going to start using some of the fund balance to to be to uh, to help supplement one time type of um, project uh, inclusions in the in the general fund budget. So it's, um, this is this is just to get us start to get us to get the employee on board, but I'm anticipating next year in our levy of capacity and our uh, other revenue sources that we sh will be able to, um, again, have the money available to fund the full, full position without a transfer from fund balance. Does that answer your question? More to the whole than just the specific. Right. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Well, and, and obviously we're not completed with 2019, but uh, even though we we pulled money from the fund balance uh, this year, also we added to the fund balance at the end of the 2018 Correct. fiscal year. So we actually okay. added more than we withdrew from that, and hopefully that same thing happens this year. We, we, so. The biggest thing that we did in 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 our budget is we we show that. Uh, we have this very large contingency because of the expenditure restraint program. Um, our budget is below, uh, without that transfer, be way below what we would need to qualify for expenditure restraint. But it, uh, uh, at the same time, you don't want to uh, not have that capacity if your costs go up in a certain position, in a certain um, category that you wouldn't be able to qualify for expenditure restraint, which that program is about $175,000 that if you don't have it, you don't get it. And your budget can't go up more than 2% or whatever um, the cost of, of inflation is. So I'm um, positioning us so that we always have that cushion um, to be able to, if you have something that has to come back into the general fund that wasn't a special revenue fund, that, that you have that capacity to still continue to qualify for expenditure restraint. Okay? Thank you. Well, and with that being said, I, I, I uh, didn't really finish what I was trying to get at with the points that Kathy made. We are putting these dollar amounts into the budget, so, I mean, if you do have some questions on these items, even though we might not be voting on the, the individual items tonight as for personnel purposes, this would be the time to discuss it. If you believe strong enough that it shouldn't be in the budget or you feel like it should be, more should be in the budget, this would be the time to discuss it. So, anybody? All right, Kathy, thank you for that recap. Appreciate it. So now we're here to the uh, moment that uh, we're looking for tonight, and this is actually uh, the resolution, 1442, which is our uh, fiscal year 2020 budget. Uh, anybody like to make a motion to approve that budget? Mayor, I'd like to make a motion to uh, approve resolution 1442, 2019, the fiscal year 2020 budget. I'll second it. Okay, we got a motion by Mayo and a second by Hagen that we approve our 2020 budget, which is in the form of resolution number 1442. Any discussion? I just would like to say I think this is one of the best budget uh, experiences I've had in many, many years. It's It was very, um, it was brief, but it also very informative at the same time. So I, I just wanted to mention that. Great. Thanks, Paul.
I think I'm actually thanking you for the staff, not for myself, of course. But yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I do. I believe they did very well too. Um, Sandy, call the roll. Okay. Dimitri Martin. Aye. Paul Hagen. Aye. Scott Prochatsky. Aye. Lori Chestnut. Aye. Paul Mayo. Aye. Dave Peterson. Aye. Eric Olson. Aye. Steve Hackett. Aye. And Mary Fair. Aye. Nine ayes, motion carry. All right, Kathy, thank you. Thank you, everybody, for approving that. Let's uh, go on to resolution number 1441, 2019. Uh, this is a resolution supporting Snow Fighters Appreciation Day. Justin? <clears throat> Thank you, Mayor. Uh, done this the last few years, uh, just supporting our hardworking streets department when they battle these snow events. We've already had a few of them. Uh, this resolution, uh, i just like to read, is on page 134 of your packet. So whereas Wisconsin is home to some 3,000 professional county and municipal snowplow operators who frequently work long hours in extremely difficult weather conditions to help keep roadways safe and open for everyone, whereas Wisconsin experiences some 40 winter weather events each year and 40 inches of snow falls each winter, whereas winter precipitation contributes to approximately 1,300 fatalities and nearly 120,000 injuries on national highways yearly, Whereas 43 road miles of public roads in the city will pack, keep our residents connected and the economy moving throughout the year. Whereas clearing snow and ice cuts winter weather related crashes up to 90%. Whereas economic studies have found that severe winter events where roads are closed can cost uh, snow belt states 300 to 700 million dollars per day. And a net cost related to snow emergencies have a severe impact on wages, tax revenue and retail sales whereas salt de-icing operations pay for themselves within 25 minutes of application and generate $6.50 in benefits for every dollar in cost after the first four hours, whereas the year-round planning for winter storms and investments in equipment and technology are critical to the well-being of our citizens, whereas emergency snow fighters interrupt time with their families at an hour and at a moment's notice to protect the drivers and, severe, and serve their communities, whereas the emergency work done by frontline snow fighters have saved and will save an unknown number of, of our citizens. Now, therefore, be it resolved, City Will Packet declares November 25th, 2019, Snow Fighter Appreciation Day. Um, finally, I, I, this is a small token of thanks to our crews. Uh, the couple, as I read this, pop, you know, sparked a, uh, a flare in my head was um, <laughs> this pulled a lot of stats and data that's out there. Um, 40 inches of snow falls each winter. Last February, we surpassed that within the second week of February. <laughs> um, then also the <clears throat> how these guys wake up, they're on call 24/7 during the winter time. Uh, I you know I talk to them every year, get sleep. And they laugh at me. I say, take time with your families, get to sleep, and, and it's difficult for them because they are responding at any time of the day, uh, night and day. Uh, so our thanks go out to them uh, to keeping our roads open and safe and clear. So um, thank you for allowing me to express that to the community and to you. Yeah, thank you, Justin. I I know how important we believe that 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 snow removal is in the city. So we appreciate the, your comments and the uh, resolution. I Mayor, I believe its predecessor told me once that we had 48 miles of city streets to plow. So just for the general public to know, that's a considerable amount of mileage they do have to plow. It's it's more than you think when you when you find that out. Wow. Yeah. Well. Yeah, we have that, plus the parking lanes are not included in that. Exactly. So, so on all these roads, we're passing through them yes. three, four times. Tremendous so. amount of work. And many times we have them cleared by noon. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So. Do a great job. Great yeah. job. That's for sure. 
Okay, let's go on to license report 147. <laughs> we have to approve it too? Yes, we do. Okay. <laughs> Anybody want to make a motion approve? to approve? So move. Uh, Chestnut Perchansky, uh, approve the resolution 1441. Sandy will call the roll. Eric Olson? Aye. Paul Mayo? Aye. Mary Fair? Aye. Steve Hackett? Aye. Scott Prochatsky? Aye. Dimitri Martin? Aye. Dave Peterson? Aye. Lori Chestnut? Aye. And Paul Hagen? Aye. Nine ayes, motion carried. I'm thinking if you voted no, your neighbors would probably not be very happy <laughs> with you. <laughs> okay, let's move on then to license port 1472. This is an operator's license, bartender's license. We have two names on there. Again, they're pending backroom checks and payments of any fines owed to the city. We would need a motion to approve. Move to approve. Second. Motion by Chestnut, second by Hackett, that we approve the operator's license, port number 1472. Discussion? All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Against? Motion carried. Uh, license port 1473, this is a taxi driver's license renewal. There are two names on there also. We just need a motion to approve. So moved. Second. Second. Motion by Fair, second by Peterson, that we approve license report 1473. This is a taxi driver's license renew. renewal. Any discussion? All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Against? Motion carried. Okay, under uh, number 10, we have Wisconsin Department of, of Transportation grant application, uh, Aaron. Promises will not take the 30 minute maximum. Um, so, I don't. We, we, yeah, unless Justin chimes in. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Justin and I have been working on this a little bit. Uh, actually, it started, we were approached by John Miller from the town of Dayton, uh, their town chairman. Um, this was a couple months ago, and it was in regards to the possibility of submitting a multi municipal grant application. This is for the multi modal fund. Um, they just announced this a couple months ago at the DOT level, uh, and it's up to a 90-10 share uh, grant. Um, so it's a good opportunity to get a lot of your costs covered. Um, and there's a number of things you can spend it on. So what, what was proposed from a, a township standpoint was kind of branching off the walking trail. Um, I think the township of Farmington was looking at doing something on King Road. Township of Dayton was looking at doing something um, on K, Highway K South. And then we had looked at getting something and extending it to um, really into the downtown area more. So just kind of like a regional um, trail system that we felt helped quality life, economic development, so on and so forth. Um, the other thing that we had talked about was the pedestrian bridge. And this is something that Justin's been working on um, the, over Riverview Park there. Uh, so the, we can apply for multiple grants. Um, the grant deadline is December 6th. We are still in the process of collecting some information on costs. Um, I can tell you that as far as the trail goes, we've kind of gone from plan A to plan B and we're on plan C. And the reason for that is, is we ran into some street right of ways that didn't allow for what we wanted to do in a couple areas. Um, and now that we're on plan C, we're kind of, after we look at the cost, we're asking ourselves, well, we want to make sure it still accomplishes something pretty good because still at a 90, 10 split, if it's a million dollar project, it's a hundred thousand dollars. And how does that affect the rest of our capital? So we expect to get that in the next week. We're, um, working with the County on that. Actually, I should say that the County, uh, because it's a multi-municipal application, the County takes control of that and we provide the County with information and they are the actually the grant applicant. So Casey Byersdorf at the County Highway Department we've been working with. Um, so anyway, I didn't want this, because it's a Dem December 6th application deadline, we will be talking about this on December 3rd likely. Um, didn't want that to be the first time you heard about it. So um, that's just a little FYI. All right, thanks. We got about 24 minutes left, anybody? <laughs> <laughs> Paul? That's my move to adjourn. Oh, no, hold on. I, oh, no, I, no. Get, I got an item here. 
Oh, you do. Sorry. Okay. Next up, we have uh, communications recommendations of the mayor. I'll be real quick. Uh, again, I just want to remember uh, we are only going to have one meeting in December, so if you have any items, get them to Sandy as soon as possible, uh, and so we can make sure that we can handle all that within that December 3rd meeting. Uh, I do want to thank Scott Prochatsky for attending uh, the mayor's department heads meetings today, uh, and I invite uh, all council members to attend that, and, and I think I have in the past also. We just can't have you all attend at the same time for space reasons and also for quorum issues too, but uh, if you'd like to attend, let us know or just stop in. We, we meet the third Tuesday, two o'clock in the afternoon in the back conference room. <clears throat> Scott said it was, uh, it was educational. Yes. So. It was a different perspective on how this group works. Uh, a lot of the same things we heard tonight uh, as far as the Burbage, but it's it's very interesting to see the the synergy they have. It's it's a pretty good group how they function. So it's very. If you have a chance, you may not like the timing because it was it's over an hour. But book your hour and you'll be fine. <laughs> yeah. I got, thanks, Scott. Anything else for the good? <laughs> Go I got one more thing. I was talking to Kathy and. I have to give kudos to Kathy here. I mean, since she's been here, we've dropped our city mill rate for the taxes about 60 cents. We've had a steady decline, and it's her expertise yes. that have helped no, us because adjust our and get us savings to do that. And I think the public needs to know we, we've our promises. You know, we're trying to keep our promises of getting the mill rates down and the taxes down, and we're slowly working that way. Right, and it's. Right. I, kudos to her for those numbers. Sometimes Absolutely. they're baffling, but you are an elected official, so it's good that you brought that up. But you are stealing Aaron's thunder. Oh, he's, sorry. <laughs> he's actually gonna he's gonna discuss uh, all of those things at our December third meeting. But well, give it I again. agree with you. Give it again. Yeah. 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 Good. yeah. Good. We will. It was a great thing to know. <laughs> we'll touch on that. Good. Yeah, thank, thank you, Scott. Scott though. We appreciate that. Yeah. Anything else, Paul? I would move to adjourn. Uh oh, Alan's not here. <laughs> second. <laughs> uh, motion by Hagen, second by Olson that we adjourn. What you do? <laughs> All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Against. Motion carried. We're adjourned at 8.02 p.m. Have a great night. Drive safe.